So in this video, we're going to get into the animations and the animator controller for our player object. So we'll be setting up a walk, idle, and run animation. We're also going to be showing how to flip the player around from left to right, depending on which direction the character is moving. And we'll set up the animator controller so that we can switch between these animations automatically based on the input we're receiving from the player input component. So if you haven't already, switch back to 2D mode in our Unity game. Let's enter the prefab of our player object and let's add in a new component. So this is going to be the animator component. I'm closing everything else we don't need right now. Add component animator. So an animator requires a runtime animator controller, which is where we set up all of the animation states and the connections between them for our player's animation. So I'm going to go into assets, characters, player, I'm going to right click in this directory, create, and then go down to animator controller. I'll call this animator controller AC player. So click on the player in the prefab hierarchy and set AC player as the controller for the animator. Now let's open up the animation and animator windows. So go to the top of Unity and choose window, animation, animation again, and that gives us our animation window. For right now, I will press and hold on the name of this window and I'll put it next to the console at the bottom left. Let's also open up window again, animation, animator. And I guess we can leave this in the default, which is next to game and scene. I might move it later by holding it and dragging it and dropping it. But for right now, that should be okay. So when our character is idling, not moving, we want it to play an idle animation, not just show a single frame. So to set that up, we use our animation window to create a animation clip. So to begin animating player, create an animation clip, hit create, and put it in the player directory. So we can see assets, characters, player. We want this animation to have a name. I'm going to call it player underscore idle, save as type anim for animation. Now you'll see this keyframe sheet where we can set up the animation by putting in frames at different keyframe times for the animation. So by default, there's 60 samples for a second of animation, but pixel art games are not generally going to have animations that change that fast. I'm going to take the samples and change it to 10. So now we have 10 samples for one second of playtime. Let's actually take the animation window and I'll put it in the top right next to the inspector so that we can have the project window and the animation open at the same time. So let's go into art and then RV Ross Adventurer individual sprites. And let's find all of the individual sprites for the idle animation. So we come down here to idle 012. So it looks like we actually have two versions of idle we can choose from. So I'm going to take frames 01 and 2 and idle 3, which is actually right below idle 2, which is a second version of the animation, and drag all of these frames into the animation window. Just select them all, left click, hold, and drag them. And when, you, and when you put them at the start here, it's going to automatically add in the property for this animation, sprite. So we're changing the sprite on each update, which is 10 times a second. So we have this animation here. We can also click on the animator window, and you'll see that this has been made the default animation for our character. And if you want to see this animation play, click on scene view. Notice how I was in game view on accident before. But in scene view, you can actually hit play in the animation window and you can see these animations go out and play. Now, there's this gizmo kind of from the player import that is showing on top of everything that is in the way. So if you click here in the scene window, the scene view, you can turn down the size of 3D icons. So I'm going to shrink that down quite a bit here so that it's not so in the way. And now we can hit play to watch our idle animation. So if you want, you can actually change the idle animation out to the second one. So I'm going to select all four of these frames and I'll put them at the start here, just swapping the frames out. Now we can hit play and we can see our second idle animation. So this one, he has the sword out and the first few ones, he has the sword sheathed. So you might prefer, so you might prefer to use the idle too. So let's just go ahead and do that instead. For now, I'll go ahead and swap back to the default idle animations. So let's hit play and make sure that's working. So idling with the sword sheathed. Now we can create the other animations. So, so let's click on the drop down for the animation names and choose create new clip in the same directory assets characters player. Let's do player underscore walk. 
and and that's dot anim by default. Okay, so with the player walk animation, scroll down in the individual sprites folder, and we should be able to find adventurer walk zero to adventurer walk five. Select them all and drag them into the animation sheet. You can hit play to test the animation here. Make sure it's working nicely. And let's create the run animation as well. So same process, click on the drop down, create new clip, player run, save, change the samples to 10 for now, and then find adventurer run inside of the art assets. So frame zero for run to frame five, drag those in here, hit play to test while you're in scene view. And there we have our run animation. So now let's open up the animator and we'll work on figuring out how these animations are going to go between each other. So to save you a step in advance, I'm actually going to right click in here and do create substate machine. So especially with a platformer controller, the animation states here can get kind of out of control. So one way to keep things more organized as we add in 10, 20 animations is to group different types of animations based on a state machine or a substate machine in this case. So make sure on the top right that you're an inspector and I'm going to take this state machine and I'm going to rename it to be ground states. So anything that has to do with movement on the ground, I'm going to put in the ground states. Attacking will be a separate thing, but if we have these internal substates like idle walk and run, which are going to be controlled by if the player is moving or not, then that will be logic controlled inside of this ground states. So we can double click into it and you'll see a substate machine, which looks a lot like the main state machine on the animator, but it's nested inside of it. So now I'm going to take these three animations, which are automatically added onto the sheet here, select them, control C to copy them, double click into ground states, control V to paste them in. And this is where we'll actually be keeping those animations. So right now I want to make the player idle the default state here. So with entry, right click on it and choose set state machine default state to player idle. Click up here to go back out to the base layer, the main state machine. For the entry point for the main state machine, I also want to make that the ground states. So I'm going to set state machine default state to ground states. And we have to select the actual animation. So I will choose player idle. Now that they've been moved into ground states, we can take these animations and delete them from the sheet here. So everything based on ground movement is going to be controlled inside of here. And it will just make it a lot cleaner to look at in the long run. So let's double click into ground states. And we have player idle, player walk, and player run. Now, how are we going to decide which animation to go between? Well, if our character is moving, then we're not going to be doing player idle. We're either going to be doing player walk or player run. So we can set up transitions between these animation states. So right click on player idle and make a transition to player run. Right click on idle again and make a transition to player walk. So in order to determine which of these transitions are going to be controlled, we need parameters which we can set on our animator controller. So in the animator window, click on parameters and let's add in a new parameter. This will be Boolean and I'll call it is moving. So is moving is going to be off by default, which will mean we'll be in player idle. But let's make a transition that when is moving is true, we either transition to player run and player walk. So now on these transitions, let's add a condition. So in the inspector window, conditions, add condition. Is moving is true, then we can move to player run. Click on the transition going to walk, add in, is moving is true. Now, obviously, this means that player idle could go to player run or player walk based on the same condition. So we need an extra condition to make sure that we're actually walking when we should be and running when we should be. So I'll add in a new Boolean, and this will be is running or is running pressed. So on the transition from idle to run, add in the condition and then choose running is equal to true. For transition between idle and walk, add in a new condition is running is false. So if the player is moving but not running, we will turn into walk. And if the player is running and moving at the same time, then we'll transition to run. Now for these transitions, we also want them to happen instantly with no lag between the animation. So expand settings in the inspector, take the transition duration, set this to zero and uncheck has exit time. So transition zero means that it will happen instantly and has exit time 
being off means that it can happen at any time during the player idle animation that we transition to run. So that means that we'll switch immediately, which is what we're going to want for most of the animations on our 2D platformer character. So click on the transition going to player walk, uncheck has exit time, transition duration zero. Now we also want to be able to go back to idle when our player is done walking or running. So let's right click on player run, make a transition to player idle, right click on player walk, make a transition to player idle. And the condition here, add a new condition is going to be is moving is false. And that's for both of them is moving is false. Turn off has exit time, transition duration zero, go back to the transition for run to idle and turn off has exit time and transition duration as well. Now a walk should also be able to turn into a run. So that's going to be depending on if running is set to true, then we transition from walk to run. So right click on player walk, make a transition to player run, click on the transition, turn off exit time, transition duration zero, add a condition is running is true. Likewise, in reverse, if running is false, then we'll turn from player run to player walk. So click on the transition, turn off has exit time, transition duration zero, add a condition, is running is false. And just go through each of them and make sure that all of the settings are correct. Now, in order for all these animations to be selected correctly, we're going to need to set the animator parameter. And we can do that inside of our player controller script, depending on what keys are pressed down. So if we have the move key pressed, then we can do is moving true. And if we have the run key pressed, then we can set is running to true. So click on player and then find the player controller script. And let's edit that up inside of Visual Studio. You might recall from the first video where we edited the player controller that I already added the is moving property. So when we set this property, we can also just update the animator controller as well. So if we're not going to use an automatic get or automatic set, then we're going to need a variable inside of our script, which we can make private to store the value. So I'm going to make a private Boolean underscore is moving lowercase on the I. And this can default to false since that's what we would expect at the start of the script. And now for our get and set, we'll reference this variable. So for the get, I'm going to add in the curly brackets so that we can add some code. If when I hit enter, you can see it already recommends what we should set for the return. So return is moving. So that means that this get value is going to return whatever this variable is set. So that means this public property is going to return the private variable value whenever we call is moving get. Okay, now we also need something for this set. So add in extra brackets. And then is moving is going to be equal to the value we pass into the setter. Looks like we don't need that um, semicolon there for the get function. But the other thing we want to do here when we set the value is that we also want to set it on the animator component, which we currently don't have reference to. So below rigid body 2D RB, I'm going to do animator and then animator lowercase. And we'll get that component on awake. So animator equals get component of type animator. And now that we have that whenever our script is running, we can set the parameters on that animator component. So animator dot set boolean, and then we have to pass in a string name. So for right now, we'll just set this directly. And I believe they called it is moving lowercase on the I, and we'll set that to whatever value we just passed into the setter function. Alternatively, you can pass in this value. Effectively, it's gonna be the same thing here. So the advantage here is that whenever we set is moving like down here on move is that we're also going to be setting the parameter on the animator. So one setter function kind of kills two birds with one stone. So that's going to handle the is moving parameter on the animator. But we want to do one more, which is is running. So let's go ahead and create a private Boolean is running, which will, of course, be false by default. And then we'll create a property to adjust that. So private Boolean is running for the get we'll do get return is running and then for the setter we'll do set is running equals value and also animator dot set bool is running lowercase on the i to the value we pass into this is running function 
So the thing is, though, we still don't have a key to actually make the character run. So we have nothing to respond to in our player controller script. So we can set up a key as a action on our player input. So where it's actions, let's double click on the input action asset. And then let's add a new action for our player action map. So click on the plus and then let's say run here. We need a key binding for our keyboard. I will go down to binding and let's check keyboard and mouse controls for the path. Click on the drop down and the quick way to do it is just to hit listen and now press the key you want to use for run. For me, that's going to be shift key or more specifically the left shift. So I will select left shift keyboard from the list here. And that's all we need to do to set up the action. So now the run action can be controlled with the left shift key on our keyboard. So let's exit out of that and save our import actions. For the events on our player input, let's drop down here, player. We now have the run event and we can attach a function that takes a callback context to this run. So inside of our script, just like with on move, I'm gonna create public void on run, input action dot callback context, context. And what we're gonna wanna check on the context is, did the button just start getting pressed down? Or in the case where it got released, was it just released? So if context dot started, then now we know that run is pressed down. So we can set is running the property to true. And we can do else if, and we can do the second condition for when it gets released, context dot, I believe it's canceled. So if the context is canceled, the button is no longer being pressed down, then is running which of course is calling our property setter function, which is going to set the value not only on this player controller script, but also on the animator. Now, a little trick, if you want these private booleans to actually be visible in the inspector so that you can kind of see it more visually, then you can serialize the field. So just like with the public variable, you can see it in the inspector by putting in square brackets, serialize field, and we can copy this down here to the is running as well. So you have to do it with the variable. You can't really serialize the properties to make them display in the inspector. At least not normally. This would be more of the proper way to do it, to serialize the field, not the property. Okay, so now we can go back to our game and take a look at everything. So if I expand player controller, you can see these is moving is running variables are here and we need to set the function to call for the run event so i'm going to click plus drag player controller down there into run select from the function drop down and choose player controller on run so we should have on move and on run interestingly and that's probably because i edited it on the player instance not the prefab but you can see that player move doesn't actually have a function right here. So if I go out to the instance, I can expand events, expand player, and you can see that this is kind of bolded. That means that it exists on this copy of the object, but not on the prefab. So got to be careful about that. We can, of course, click on the top right and do modified component, apply to prefab player, which will take whatever changes we've made here and apply them to the prefab. Just be careful that all the changes are something you actually want on the prefab. So now jumping into the prefab, we can see our events player and we have on move and we have on run. So exit the prefab, click on our player instance, hit play, and let's try moving around and see if is moving gets set here. So you can see in the player controller script it is. If I hold shift, it does get set on is running as well. And you can actually see the animations are changing. So this is walk and this is run when I hold shift. Now the movement speed is still the same between them, but that's an easy fix. To make sure that these variables are being set, you can also take the animator, drag them down here to the bottom. While you have the active object running, these values are going to be set in real time. You can see which animation is playing in real time. So I hit right and you can see player walk is playing and it's looping over and over again. If I hold shift down and I move, you can see it transitions to player run. So we got player run going on there. You can see the parameters being set over here on the left is moving and is running. So these are synchronized between our animator parameters and the values on our player controller script. So that's exactly what we're looking for there. So let's hit play to go out of play mode, jump back into our script. So at the top, we had walk speed. So 
To make our player run faster, when we have run pressed down, let's create a run speed. So public float run speed, and I'll set that to 8F. The F, of course, just being for float. And now we just need to have some way of selecting between which walk speed we're going to use. So let's create a property that will use the current values for is moving and is running to determine what speed we should set the current velocity of the player at. So I'm going to call this public float current walk speed current move speed. And this is going to be a this is just going to be a getter function, actually. So rather than getting a variable value, we're going to run a calculation here. So we take the booleans of our script and we'll use that to return the right walk or run speed or even idle speed. So if is moving is true, then we also want to check if it's running. So if is running, and I'm just accessing the properties here rather than the variables directly, then we're going to return the run speed, of course. So return run speed. And if it's not running, then it's walking. So else return walk speed. But what if neither of those are true? If neither of those are true, then we're going to want to return zero because that's the idle speed. So return zero. I could just put a little comment here. Idle speed is zero. So now what I want to do with this is go down to where we update the velocity. So I'm just copy pasting the name of that property. And let's see where we have fixed update RB velocity is equal to the walk speed on the X. I'm just going to paste in there the current move speed. So depending on whether we're walking or running or idling, that's going to determine our X movement speed. So let's go back out to the game now. Hit play. And now here's our walk speed. If we idle, of course, the speed is nothing. And if I hold shift down, well, there's our run speed. So run, walk, idle. So you can see how this actually is a differing value now. So the last thing we need to do is to flip the player depending on if we're walking to the left or the right. So in our script, what we're going to want to do whenever we get the movement input, we want to set the facing direction based on if that movement input on the X value is positive or negative. So let's call a new function here. I'll do set facing direction. And I want to pass in the move input in order to determine which direction it's going to face. So I'll hit control period, generate a method right below. There we have our private void set facing direction, taking move input. So what I want to check is if the movement input dot x is greater than zero, then I want to face the right. Else, if the movement input dot x is less than zero, I want to face the left. So whenever we update the facing direction, I want to make sure that they're not already facing the right direction. So in this case, I want to see if it's facing left before we force the player to start facing the right, because we're going to be reversing the local scale, and we only want to do that when it's necessary. So as a extra condition to ampersands for and, and we're going to do exclamation point is facing right. So if it's not already facing the right, in other words, facing the left, then we're going to reverse that to face the right when the movement input is greater than zero. So it should be facing the right. Then down here, and and is facing right as one of the conditions for if we should switch it to face the left. So let's generate this as a property. Control period to do that is facing right. And then down here, we can do is facing right is true. And is facing right is false. So we can scroll up to the top and find the is facing right. Uh, you don't have to do it this way. You could just put it in the function we called down here. But we have to reverse the local scale to make sure that the character is completely facing the left or completely facing the right. And what I mean by that is any other child components are also going to automatically face the right direction because they inherit the direction from the parent's scale. So let's go up here to the top, create a field variable. Public pool is facing right. And that's going to be equal to true by default because our player faces to the right by default. So as long as that's true, we want this to be true as well. And then let's create our get and set. So for the getter, return is facing right. 
And then for the setter function, let's add that in as well. A couple extra lines. What we'll do is facing right is equal to the value. But then right above that, I want to check if the value is a new value. So if is facing right does not equal value, so as in it's a different value, then what we're going to do is to flip the local scale to make the player face the opposite direction. So that is going to be the transform dot uh, local scale is going to be flipped by doing times equal. And we're going to multiply that by a new vector two, negative one on the X, one on the Y. So this means we leave the Y scale alone, but we're going to flip the X value on the local scale. So whatever direction it was before, it's going to reverse that direction for all of the components, all of the child game objects on this player. Okay, so now set facing direction is going to take the movement input. It's going to use that to determine which direction it should be facing. And if that does not match the current direction, then we're going to flip the direction. And then in the setter for is facing right, Whenever we flip the value, we're also going to flip the scale, making our character face the opposite direction. Okay, so back out in game view, let's hit play, and let's try pressing the left key. And you can see our character flips to the left. If we press right, our character flips to the right as well. Why am I flipping the scale instead of just flipping the sprite using the sprite renderer right here? So let me show you an example, and we'll go into this obviously more in future videos, but I'm gonna create a child game object you can see its scale is 1, 1, right? So let's add in a sprite renderer for this child game object. And let's just throw in some random sprite here. And we'll offset it by a certain amount. So this is offset to the right. Just imagine this was like our sword hitbox in the future. Okay, so I'm going to hit play. If we had flipped the sprite rather than flipping the direction of the scale, then when I press left, our sword hitbox wouldn't flip with the character. But when we flip the scale, now that means we're flipping the location of the sword hitbox. So this is going to make setting up directional based child components much easier because now our positions for those are going to be based on the parent's scale. But if you just flip the parent sprite renderer like this, you can see that doesn't actually flip the hitbox, which would make flipping from this to this a lot more of a pain in the future. So that's basically why we're doing that. I can delete that extra game object for now. So taking a look at the list here, that's pretty much everything I wanted to cover with this part of the course. We have the idle, walk, and shift run animation setting up with an extra action. We can flip the scale, which flips the player, not just the sprite, but also any child game objects. And we have the animator set up to handle all of this logic inside of that ground states substate machine. 